This episode is proudly supported by Pepe Sayer Australian Cultured Butter, batch churned from single origin cream. We've got a culturing process, a fermenting process, an aging process. So the butter will taste very different than, I guess, the average supermarket butter. Uh, I like to say we make butter makers butter. Like this is the sort of butter butter makers will would like to eat simply because of the slow process in which we ferment and age and, and get the flavour into it. You know, the natural fermentation that gets all the flavours into the cream and then once you churn it, you end up with this really rich, flavoursome butter that evolves and changes because it's a live culture that's in the butter as well. For more information, go to pepisaya.com.au. Chin Chin is a crazy busy restaurant and that has given me and the and the group and everyone that we that I get to work with the greatest platform from which to make the most people happy that we can you know like that's that's the goal at the end of the day where you know you say we've we've had an impact but the, the people have had an impact on us this is the deep in the weeds podcast i'm anthony huckstep stormed into Melbourne like a reckless teen with a bad attitude and took everyone in the food industry by surprise. But now Chin Chin is one of Melbourne's long-standing success stories with a Sydney outpost too. What does it take to create a business model that is so successful over so many years? Benjamin Cooper is the executive chef of Chin Chin in Melbourne and Sydney. Benjamin, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good sir, how are you? Good. It's good to get you on the show. You're part of a, a restaurant that just um, really took Melbourne by a storm and hasn't stopped since. Um, well, what, what's things like at the moment? Uh, amazing. It, it's been a. It's you know ever since COVID sort of dis, you know disappeared into the background and, and life tried to get back to normal. The, the city's been been slowly coming back to life, and Chin Chin's been enjoying having guests in the in the room again. Tell, tell us a little bit about Chin Chin. It's been around for a little while now, and it seems to be um, full all the time over the over its lifespan. Um, what's it been like being part of such a um, success story? Uh, amazing. I mean, we're we're twelve years old in about a week. Um, it's been it's the longest period of time I've ever spent working anywhere. Um, and it's also the greatest place I've ever spent time working. The, the, the group is phenomenal. Like it's, it's, you know, even 12 years later, it's still exciting to walk into the venue and to, to spend time in service and to do events and to, to cook the food and to interact with the guests. It's like there's, it's always been fun. Tell us a little bit about that. That's interesting that it's the place you've worked at for the longest and you've also loved the most. Well, why do you think that is? Uh, good, good question. I've, I've had an amazing career. Like I've, I've, I've worked for some incredible people, um, real, you know, real sort of industry leaders and, and places that have challenged the boundaries and, and energetic and, and whatnot. But, uh, I'd never worked with anyone like Chris in my life. Um, he's a phenomenal businessman, but he's also, uh, you know, he's a visionary. And, and when he sets out to achieve something, it's he's one of the few people I've ever worked with in my life that is capable of fulfilling the vision. You sit there, you know, you sit there 12 months out, 24 months out, 36 months out from a project, and he rattles off the idea and then you get there – all those months later and, and you're sitting in what was so clearly described to you previously. And, and it's, it's such a powerful, exciting thing to be around. I've, um, and, and at the same time, I've never had a boss that's given me the freedom and the opportunity to be myself and to challenge myself and to push myself and to discover who I am as a chef like Chris has, you know, like he, his expectations are a huge, but he also offers such a, an amazing platform from which to operate and discover and to grow and evolve. Uh, and I think that's probably why I've 
stayed so long and probably why I continue to be so happy being there because uh, complacency is not an issue. Well, that's a fascinating insight into into that sort of world there. You, you mentioned how you sort of had a license to really go for it with what you do. How much have you changed in this sort of um, over, oh, well, over a decade and, and how much has your food changed in those insights because of being allowed that freedom? Um, I feel... I feel like I became a chef that I probably never would have if I didn't have someone like Chris and and the venue and the the greater team to support the journey. Uh, you know, like it was a real early on. It, it, it's not. I'm not suggesting that it was easier a walk in the park. You know, there were days that was were insanely challenging, um, but the. the it was never a I need to give up, this is too much moment. It was always it was always I can understand why they're doing it because they see that I can do better myself. And to have that sort of support is is quite surreal. Um, you know, someone that looks at you and goes and can see within you sometimes more than you can see within yourself. It's amazing that you experience that with Chin Chin and you continue to do that because you you know, have a look at your CV. It's quite extraordinary and you've worked with some incredible people and I want to delve into that. But take us back to when you were young. Um, what sort of role did food play for you growing up? Uh, <laughs> this one, this one's going to make you laugh. Uh, I grew up in a, in a small country town. Um, you know, life was was pretty normal uh, for, you know, pretty normal Australian upbringing. Small country town, simple food, barbecues and, and the like. Uh, I never really thought much about food until my mum made me a Mexican bean dish one day. And she, she liked to play on the odd occasion, not always, but on the odd occasion. Um, and And it blew my mind. And I was like, that's, you know, like growing up, I would eat bowls of porridge, I would eat cauliflower cheese, I would eat spaghetti with chicken stock cube and butter. You know, like I was fussy. Uh, there wasn't a lot that I was fond of. Um, and my nan was a great cook, you know, like she made, uh, especially, you know, the the classic pancakes and scones and um and so that sort of stuff I love, but like food at, at a greater level didn't really until this bean dish, and then and then it was like a light bulb going off in my head. I was like, oh, holy, you know, this is this is next level. This is like my taste buds were alive, and uh, and the, and the flavors and the textures, and yeah, that was a moment. Was was a career in food something that you thought about from a young age, or you know, was when when was the moment that that happened? Uh, no, originally I was going to study economics law. Tell us about um, you know the moment that you you know moved away from that and moved into food. Uh, okay, it's a there's a lot there's a lot that goes into this. Um, <laughs> Uh, my, um, and I may, I may get emotional, so apologies. Um, my mum got very sick when I was about 16. Uh, she got leukemia and, uh, it was about then that I suddenly realized there was probably more to life than just school and study. Um, uh, you know, spending time with my mum and, and whatnot was more important. Uh, and uh, school became secondary. I didn't get the marks I needed to get into economics law in the end. Uh, still thought that I would do it and finished up school and decided to take a year off from work and thought that I would then go to school to uni mature age and do my economics law. Um, mum passed away when I was 20 and... Um, be previous to her, previous to getting to that point uh, in that year that I decided to take up a gap year, 
I uh, was fortunate to be working in Manly, working as a, a kitchen hand and washing dishes in several different cafes and living the good life. I was uh, I was making incredible money and buying surfboards and bodyboards and skateboards and music and stereos and and uh, and then one day one of my chefs, uh, a lady by the name of Vicky Harris, who's still a very close friend of mine and now lives up in Queensland. Uh, she was ex-Rockpool. She said, maybe you should do an apprenticeship. And I thought, okay, well, that's a that's an interesting possibility. Uh, and she said, well, you know, it's, it's four years. You do that. I know you've spoken about wanting to do law. You'll be 23. You can finish this and start that. And I was like, yeah, you know what? That That's actually a really good idea. Like if I do that, then I've also got a career to support myself with while I go through law. Uh, and that'll be, you know, the best of both worlds and and it'll be a good, good move forward. Uh, and to be honest, the first day I ever spent in the kitchen with her when I moved from being a kitchen aunt to actually the first day training as an apprentice chef uh, was one of the greatest days of my life. And... Um, I don't think I've ever felt as at peace or at home or at purpose in my life. Yeah. So it was, so it was, um, whether it was life telling me that the next year or two would be pretty shitty and I would need, good people around me or whether it was whatever the world put me in a kitchen and and I'm forever grateful well many people have, have enjoyed your food since then in those early days when you sort of took that leap and you know chefing was looking like your future um, who were the really important people and venues that you worked at and with as you started to build your career so Vicky Harris 100%. She used to run a, a restaurant in Manly called Brazil Cafe and then Toucan and several others. She's an amazing chef. Um, but then uh, I used to work at Rockpool and Wokpool on my days off. So I worked with Loz, went in and learnt pastries from Loz at Rockpool, um, Lorraine Godsmart. Um, met Michael McInerney through that group. Uh, ended up working with Mikey in London for over several years. Met an incredible array of people through the through the Vicky and the Rockpool connection. Um, used to go and work at Bistro Moncur on my days off. Um, I, I basically for three years I basically was either labouring for a friend of mine doing demolition on my days off, or I was working in other restaurants. Wow. What, what was it that was driving you to be doing so many things at, at once? Um, I have a really high level of energy. Like even, you know, today at 48, I'm, I'm still um, incredibly <coughs> energized and driven and, and I, I go to the gym on my breaks and I, I walk in the mornings and I, uh, I have a busy brain and I like to be, I like to be doing things. Um, I think I draw my sense of life satisfaction from the act of doing. Um, and very early on, I connected. Um, and I, I spoke earlier about mum, and, and mum's losses played a big part in my life and my life view. Uh, but I. I realized very early on that my goal is just to make people happy. Like that's, that's what I set out in life to achieve. Um, and I realized that cooking was intrinsically linked to that experience and was, uh, you could be as invested or not as you wanted to be. So you could create a meal and share it with someone and they would find joy and never need to know it was you or you could create a meal and share 
and they knew it was you and you could also be part of the experience, you could choose either. Um, and so that was that was what drove me to to push myself. I, I realized I had, you know, life is finite. So um, I figured, and I, I told my apprentices this the other day, I figured that if I was going to get to a point where I was going to run kitchens, I had to be doing more than every other young chef out there was doing. And that's not to say there weren't other young chefs doing what I was because there definitely is. But that's how I believe you get to the top. You you have to put yourself out there and you have to push yourself and you have to drive and you have to have an insane level of commitment in order to 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 stand out enough to make a good life for yourself. You spent a lot of time in the UK um, building your uh, career and rising the ranks over there. Was, tell us a little bit about your time over there. What were the real sort of highlights for you? Uh, London was amazing. And my wife and I lived in London for five years. Uh, we went over, were engaged, went over, came back, got married, went back. Um, again, worked in worked at Bluebird in, in Chelsea with Michael McInerney and John Turode. Uh That led to jobs at Pharmacy in, in Notting Hill, to Smiths of Smithfield in Farringdon, to Nobu, back to Scott's. Um, it was a real, again, lucky. I, and I've, I've always felt uh, that everything you achieve in life has a certain amount of luck attached to it. Uh, and, and someone sprinkled lucky dust all over my career. I've, I've been, you know, really lucky and worked hard for it. But, um, London was this big restaurants in London were, were not the anomaly. They were the norm. Right. So, I went to London, left here. I was working at Wokpool at the time, which was – Wokpool Darling Harbour was a huge restaurant. I don't know if you remember it at all, but um, it was crazy, right? Like – and and we used to have all – the whole industry used to come and eat there. It was an amazing experience, and Kylie was a legend to work for. And um, So I went to London with some experience in big restaurants, which opened the door to getting experience in bigger restaurants, which opened the door to coming back here and running – what would end up being one of Australia's busiest and biggest restaurants ever. <laughs> yeah. Um, before we get to Chin Chin, David Thompson play, played a pretty big role in your life as well. You worked with him. Um, do you have any stories of the influence he's had on you? Um, David was a, an amazing, is an amazing chef. A, a genius in my eyes. Um I have a huge amount of respect for him and, and for everything that he taught me. Uh, I worked for him at Nam in the Halkin Hotel and it was only a little, I think from memory, 45 seats, maybe 50 seats. So a tiny restaurant. Uh, and I'd come from working at Nobu where we would do 550 covers on a busy night. Um, and... To go to a 50 seat restaurant, I was like, yeah, that's all right. And, you know, easy walking park. Those shifts were more intense than doing 550. Like it was, it was so, um, it was mind blowing. Like we, we used to pound all our numb pricks to order. We used to, you know, there were, there were soup pastes that we would pound to order. There were, there were different spice mixes that we would pound to order. There was like, I used to come home with, um, chili blisters up my arms from the mortar and pestle from pounding chilies and spice mixes all day long. Uh, and it was, that was like a moment where I connected. It's, it's not, it's not the numbers and it's not the, the restaurant and it's not the, you know, it's not, do you start this from scratch or do you do it this way? Or how do you do this? It is, how do you get, the greatest dish to the table that is connect connected the best to its roots, but also connected the best to the guest experience. 
uh, and it made me look at my food in a in a completely different way. So if pounding to order was the right thing to do, that's what we do. So for instance, at Chin Chin, we cook our jungle curry to order. It's a, it's a fresh paste cooked to order every time we make jungle curry. Because for me, that's the best result for that curry. Muscle and curry, we make, you know, we make a huge batch of muscle and curry, cook it out slowly. It takes about three and a half, four hours, braise the meats, br- bring it all together and make this beautiful curry. There's no way you can do that to order. The process dictates that you, to give it the most respect you can, you have to follow that. But for me, jungle was, so we do it to order, right? Um, that I think that's a really important thing for chefs to find and to come to terms with within their own food that you you can have myriad different ways of doing things and and myriad different techniques that you can use and myriad different levels of expectation that you can deliver within a set space you know I've always said to my chefs and and the chefs that I'm fortunate enough to be able to work with every day and that I get to spend time with uh we we may not have a hat we may not you know but i've never cared about that because i've done in my training i've worked in three michelin star restaurants two one i've worked in three hat two hat one hat if there's a technique or an experience from any of those places that i want to use at chin chin to create a dish that's what we'll do you don't you don't do cafe food because you don't have hats but if cafe food is amazing, then there's no reason why you can't do cafe food in a hatted restaurant. You just change the process, right? Does that does that make sense? Like, and so that was, um, that's what London taught me. Take all of your experience. Take you know, I, I worked in catering. I worked in event, in, like in an events place. Um, utilize all the knowledge you can and bring it all together always. After the extraordinary experience uh, abroad, what was it like for you coming back to Australia? Uh, initially weird because my wife's from Melbourne, so we came back, we moved to Melbourne. I, I grew up in New South Wales. Um, so it was almost like not being in Australia, but being in Australia. Cause I, prior to going to London, I hadn't spent a lot of time in Melbourne. I loved it, the, the few visits that we'd had, um, but it felt more like still being overseas. You know, it's a really great cosmopolitan city. It's, it's got a huge European influence. It's, um, the dining experience is probably similar to what I experienced in London, so I didn't really, yeah, it was weird. Where, where did you find your feet and, um, you know, what were the venues that you sort of jumped into when you did get back? Uh, started as a sous chef at Ezard. Ended up head chef about six months, 12 months later. I can't remember actually. About 12 months later, I think. Uh, was head chef slash exec chef of Ezard Ginger Boy for up until the opening of Ginger Boy. Um Ended up head chef at Long Grain for a while. Worked at St. Ali in South Melbourne for about five years. And uh, left St. Ali to, to come and work for Chris. Tell us about how that happened. Uh, so about 12 months before I started working for Chris, he said, I, I received a message saying that, you know, the, there was work and was I interested and, uh, I've always been incredibly loyal to wherever I'm working. Um, and at the time I was, life was amazing and everything was good and I was being pushed and the boundaries were, you know, were there to challenge. And so I, I messaged, you know, basically said, look, life's good at the moment, but if things change for sure, uh, and fair enough, 12 months later, things had changed and, I came and saw Chris and Chin Chin was about to open and he had this amazing space and incredible team and everyone was energized and it was like, it was buzzing and, and I basically said, oh, look, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of leaving and I've, I've got a few ideas and 
he just looked at me and said, well, you're not making the right decision until you come work for me. Um, and I really respected that and thought, you know, that's a great answer. That's the sort of person I want to work for. And so took the job and the rest is history. Tell us about, about your foods. You know, it's very entrenched with uh, Asian cookery. Um, but finding your voice on the plate and the creation of Chin Chin, like where, where did that all sort of work out and where did you land on your feet where you were comfortable with your cooking? It's probably, there's, there's multiple elements to that answer. Um, my, my food up until the point where I started reaching senior levels of the kitchen, like I said, I'd, I'd worked in so many places and gone and worked for so many different chefs on my days off and read so many books. I'm, I think by the time I was a third year apprentice, I had about 500 cookbooks. Um, I, I love reading, like, you know, I've got thousands of cookbooks in my collection now I, and I've, I've given away a lot and lost some in movements and whatever. I think I've probably got somewhere around 1,200 cookbooks now in my collection and another, you know, thousands of other sort of literature books. Um, so I read a lot and so my experience of food, I landed with Asian because it's what made me happy but I was reading French cookbooks and Spanish cookbooks and Italian and, and Middle Eastern and Mediterranean and North African. And uh, I was always intrigued by uh, spice and chili. They're the two things that just, that float my boat. Uh, and so I sort of followed that path and uh, at the same time as that was evolving and my knowledge of food was evolving and and the more I cooked, like I used to cook dinner parties on my days off and my wife and I would throw dinner parties and people, you know, we'd have 20, 30, 40 people at our house eating. Um, and in London especially, like if I, if I threw a dinner party in London, there would be 20 people minimum would rock up because in London no one, no, you don't go to people's houses, you meet at the pub. Right, so like it was a, um, it was this. That was where I tested things, and so as I'm doing all this, I was also personally very comfortable with myself. I'd had amazing support throughout my life, and and people that were incredible mentors for me to look up to that were like just you know. Be you, don't don't try and be anyone else. Be you and find the best you that you can be. Uh, and so the me that I knew was comfortable, which allowed the food me to become more comfortable faster. And the more comfortable that became, the more my food found itself. And that was that was a, a great journey but like I said when I got to Chin Chin Chris pushed pushed me further and harder than anyone else ever had in my career and I reckon it was probably year two maybe yeah year two into year three that uh, that that really came to fruition and that I that my food really started to evolve at a rapid rate of knots and uh, things started coming together and I started pushing my boundaries further. Like, for instance, I don't know if you've ever had the rendang at Chin Chin. Uh, when I was at St. Ali, I used to do quite a bit of Middle Eastern slash Mediterranean food and dukkha was, dukkha was one of my favourite things ever. Um, and... And Dukkha blew my mind because most of my training with Asian spices had been you grind them to powders, refined, blah, blah, blah. But Dukkha is all textural and whole spices and whatnot, right? And so when I came to make the rendang and I was looking at the spice mix, I was looking at it going, 
these spices are pretty similar to what you would find in a Dukkha base. And uh, so rather than grind them to a powder and cook them out and then just become part of the flavor profile, I'm going to do a dry roasted Thai style Dukkha mix and add it into the seasoning. And suddenly, suddenly it was my rendang on the plate. It was a rendang that I spent eight months studying like every recipe I could find to find the recipe that, to find the, my version of a recipe that I was happy to serve. And there's elements from like probably, I don't know, somewhere between eight and 12 different, different recipes in there. And, and the spice mix, the way I roasted it and finished it was the last key. And when you start doing that, then you start to go, this is how I, this is how my food gets to the plate. This is the journey that that it has to take in order for it to be a meat dish. Chin Chin absolutely exploded onto the scene. Tell us a bit about the build up to that. What was it like? Um, like I said, I like I came on board as it was opening, uh, and took over as exec chef about twelve weeks later due to several circumstances that you know are what they are. Um, but there, it was almost like there was no, it was almost like, here's a switch, it's off, it's on. And once it was on, they removed the off component of that switch and just left it. <laughs> and that, and that's what it's felt like. Like it, it's, it, it, it surpassed all of my wildest dreams. You know, I think it surpassed Chris's wildest dreams. I think it surpassed everyone's wildest dreams. I remember chefs, and I'm not going to name any names because I don't need to, but there were chefs in the early days that were like, oh, yeah, you know, you're busy now, but, you know, six months' time or 12 months' time, blah, 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 you you know, you'll be quiet again. And then six months later, they're like, oh, it's still busy. And, 12 months, and then three years later, they're like, amazing. It's still, you know, I don't think anyone – and – Maybe that's part of what drives us to keep pushing forward and to keep pushing the envelope. Like the goal at Chin Chin is simple. We have guests to serve and make happy. That's all we care about. It's not about me and reputation and hats and people's opinions. And the only people's opinions that we care about are the guests. And and we strive every day to make the most guests people most guests happy that we can. Why why do you think it's uh, been so successful? I think because a because of that because we do actually that's that's the goal is to make people happy right so we we strive for that every day and we we challenge ourselves and we push ourselves and we you know I'm not suggesting for a moment that you get it right 100 percent of the time but you try and get it right the largest percentage of time possible that you can uh, we review things con- consistently we and constantly we we challenge the boundaries of, of what we think we can achieve we the the demographic is almost impossible to pin down you know like we have everything from young students through to to old couples in there on date night you know like in their 70s and 80s sitting for for lunch it's it's beautiful and and there's no preconceived notion that you don't fit it's 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 the democratic dining room a couple of years ago you opened um Chin Chin in Sydney, how, how different is it to the Melbourne venue and, and what's it like for you, sort of executive chef over the two venues? Uh, look, I'm in an incredibly fortunate situation where I am that I have uh, an executive chef in Melbourne, Dan Briggs, uh, who, who runs that venue and does an incredible job. And I have we have an exec chef in Sydney who runs that venue, Matthew McLeod. Uh, who also does an incredible job and they take care of you know all the day to day and the and the they they do an incredible amount of work um, and an incredibly good job uh, and I get to come in and share my time with them and with the teams and to do cooking classes and to do special events and to do um, 
the things that are layered over the top, the guest facing stuff and, and, and things like that. So uh, Sydney was, you know, for me personally, Sydney was um, quite emotional because it's where I started my career. And mum wasn't around, you know, dad was up in Queensland. The, there was no real family connection to it, but there was this, in, it, the, the beating heart of my cooking was started there. So like it was to, to come back and, and to be given the opportunity via Chris of opening a restaurant in what I think is one of Sydney's great buildings was incredible. Um, and it was about trying to do that building justice and to do justice to the Sydney dining scene and to respect our guests. Um, you know, to deliver, we didn't want to come up to Sydney and think we're bringing Melbourne Chin Chin to Sydney. We wanted to bring Sydney Chin Chin to Sydney. And I think it's healthy that Sydney Chin Chin and Melbourne Chin Chin, even though they share an undeniable DNA, are slightly different. Um, so it's been, you know, it's been amazing. I, I love them both. They're, they're both incredible restaurants. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be able to work in them. The last couple of years have been um, challenging for everybody, as we all know. Um, has, has the period of time sort of changed your focus and sort of what you want to get out of um, the industry? Interesting question. Uh, I think, if anything, the last couple of years for me sort of made me look at what are the possibilities and what are the opportunities you know, like cooking classes largely came out of that. We did some online during lockdown. They were very well received. We'd done, you know, prior, but <coughs> the the online thing made it made it feasible. And so that became a an option and an extension of what we've been able to do as as a restaurant group. Um, and doing those is really inspiring like it's 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 really amazing to be given the opportunity to to sit with a room of people and share your knowledge and passion for food and so you then look at how that impacts the interaction with your staff and and your team and you're passing on of knowledge and how you're utilizing your experience to broaden the value for any apprentices that work within your group. Um, but also what the, uh, what the guest feels is part of the Chin Chin experience. So that, it, it, it certainly opened the, the possibilities and, and the opportunities and, and I've, I've loved it. Like the cooking classes are amazing. Yeah, um, you know, it's easy to stand back and go, look, it was tough and it was hard. And yes, it was. It was crappy. Uh, but it was also moments of reflection and opportunities to to review and, and reflect and question. And uh, I like to think we've come out the other side re-energized and and driven and, and moving forward. And uh, that's that's what I've tried to take out of it. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, but yes. Well, you've had the most incredible impact on um, Melbourne and now also Sydney. What do you love about what you do? Uh, largely what we spoke about earlier. Um Chin Chin is a crazy busy restaurant and that has given me and the and the group and everyone that we that I get to work with the greatest platform from which to make the most people happy that we can you know like that's that's the goal at the end of the day where you know you say we've we've had an impact but the, the people have had an impact on us we I've always felt it's the people's restaurant, like, you know, and I, and I honestly believe that. And uh, I feel humbled to, to be able to turn up to work every day and to continue to uh, get to do what I do. 
that's that's the joy I take out of it. Like it's it's such a it's such an honour to be for me to be able to work with my teams at work and to 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 the with the back office crew and with Chris Lucas, who, like I said, he's for me the greatest boss I've ever had the opportunity to work with. Um, I I wake up every morning just driven as all hell to be better than I was yesterday and to, to deliver more and whether that means, you know, who knows, maybe another chin chin in Australia somewhere or maybe maybe we end up with one overseas. I don't know. I don't know what that stuff looks like. But like if the call comes out and Chris says to me one day, you know, all right, it's time for a chin chin in New York, I'm there for it. I'm whatever he needs, I'm there. Like I'm I love that people love the tension experience you know like I've been I've been in Vietnam and London and New York and places all over the world and people have gone oh Chin Chin yeah we've had an amazing meal there that blows my mind you know that's that's at the core of what we try to achieve I've I again I say to my my crew a lot the the, the consistency is king if you can deliver something that people can have faith in the standard, that's that's what they're after. That's what they're chasing, you know. And people know that they can say, I've got international guests in, we'll take them into to Chin Chin and have a feast. And they know that the guest is going to get the experience, you know, 99% of the time, hopefully 100% of the time, they know that they're going to get the experience that they've told the guest about. That's the goal. Well, Benjamin, it's an absolute honour to have you on Deep in the Weeds today to hear just a bit of your story. Um, please keep in touch and would love to catch up again soon. Uh, yeah, and, and honestly, I, I'm humbled that you, that you asked me. Like, it's, you know, I've, I've followed this journey of yours and, and, the, and the people that you've interviewed, and I'm humbled to be part of the crowd that you've had on because, yeah, there are, there are, there are a huge number of chefs that you've had on on this, on this podcast, and it's been, you know, I've watched it. It's amazing. And their stories are amazing, and to be to be asked to be part of that journey is, you know, it's really humbling. So thank you. Well, uh, we're honoured to have you on, mate, and um, we'll have to catch up with you soon. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>